Hi, Lewis. Uh, welcome to Network Capital. Uh, in this podcast, we try and uh, demystify why people do what they do. We have, uh, in about six months, we've got 100,000 subscribers who are keen to understand the career principles and mental models of leaders in different backgrounds from different countries. Uh, you've had a, a very successful career in business and also shaping society. So we'd uh, love to understand briefly uh, who you are and what you do today. Thanks, Utkarsh, for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over the last 30 years is that I need to be open to opportunities. And whatever I'm doing today is because someone came up to me with that thought and said, Lewis, why don't you look at it? And that's what's made my journey interesting. The fact that I've done so many different things, uh, which were totally unplanned. So when I was at, uh, I, I started, study, grew up all over the country, went to college in uh, Mumbai, then trained to be a chartered accountant, and got admitted into the University of Chicago to do an MBA. And, uh, and like a lot of us at that time in the late 80s, we thought we'd work there for a few years, make some money, and then come back to India. And uh, I, I summer trained in Citibank in New York. And uh, was going to go back over there for the summer, uh, for full time. And uh, I got a call from, got a letter, sorry, a letter. Those were the days when we got letters. They were not <laughs> Wow. Got a letter saying we'd like you to interview with the Asia Pacific uh, region of Sydney. And I wasn't planning on going back so early. But to me, it was a free trip to New York. So literally, I went there, went up with a friend the previous night, got drunk. Because I wasn't interested in the interviews. But the people the, uh, I met, the first person was drove me nuts. The second person uh, caused my hangover to kick in. The third guy was this chap called Jaidev Ayer from uh, Citibank India. And he talked about this very interesting job uh, to sell, to create and sell foreign exchange products in India. And uh, it was by far the most interesting offer I'd received, and it paid the least amount of money. And uh, and I came back because I've, I've always believed. But what that was the thought was... process at that yeah, time? Yeah, go ahead. How did how, how old were you, and how did you decide to take the interesting sure. job that paid the least? I was 28 at that time, a little, little under 28, and uh, and I was you know there was this just after the huge stock market crash in October. 2007, sorry, 1987, and uh, jobs were tough to come by. I had a lot of the offers I was getting or conversations I was having were to do with being in financial control because of my accounting uh, background. So, uh, and uh, they didn't excite me. It gave me a chance to stay on in the U.S., but the jobs weren't exciting. And here was this guy coming and talking about a job which paid me the equivalent of $4,000 a year to work in India and uh, and do something which was not finance related in the sense that it wasn't with financial reporting. It was to do with marketing and, and selling products. Now, there's nothing in my CV which said that I was a seller, but he had talked to people who knew me and felt that this would be appropriate for me. And that's what got me excited. So... I remember talking to my dad at that time and uh, and the view at that time was, you know, spend a few years in the U.S. and then come back. But, you know, I said, if I'm, if I'm going to stay on in the U.S. and I'm going to have jobs which don't excite me, I'd, uh, I'd be miserable. And uh, this was the age when you got to do things which are different. So I decided to take it. And it, in hindsight, it was great because the team that I was working at in Citibank, uh, we, we, we were re redoing a plan for the bank and the bank implemented the plan and then the bank lost a lot of money over the next two years. So I presume that half the team would have got fired over the, the next couple of years. Another friend of mine was running foreign exchange uh, in New York for Citibank. He's a company to work for me. And, and uh, if I'd taken up his offer, I'd have been out of a job because a year later, that whole first year batch was fired because of cost cutting. So it worked out, you know, in a way. Uh, great for me. It uh, uh, I, I came back to India 
and it actually set me up on a journey that was, in my view, fascinating. I spent three years over there, and then I got a uh, talking to a friend of mine this morning. In the morning, how were those three was, years? At what time? Well, I enjoyed. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed yeah. those three years. Uh, I was the first guy in the office. I was the last guy out. In between, I'd sometimes go and play rugby and go back to the office. I really enjoyed my work. And as I've told people, it's, you've got to do what you enjoy. I enjoyed it, but at the same time, there were some things which I didn't necessarily enjoy, some of the stuff that we were doing. So I was talking to a friend of mine one morning, a colleague of mine, and again, that, after, that evening, she was uh, having dinner with the guy who ran the treasury at HSBC. And he said, I need someone to run treasury sales uh, for me. And she said, talk to Lewis. He said, Lewis will never leave. You know, he's a diehard city banker, which I was. And she said, have that conversation. And he called me up the next day. And, you know, within a week, I decided to move on to HSBC, which again, wasn't doing well at that time. It was a much smaller bank than Citibank. But for me, again, it was the challenge of running a team and building it out. So, uh, and of Luis, course, I just want to, I want yeah. I want you to explain your thought process at that time. You said two really interesting things. One about, uh, uh, you know, doing something you, you enjoy. And uh, the second is that you mentioned early on about how opportunities came to you. A lot of them were unplanned. So, like, in hindsight, how do you think people who are either not in jobs that they're particularly enjoying, how should they try and uh, move towards jobs or opportunities that are that way? And uh, do you feel that uh, the luck that you created or the opportunities that came your way were uh, uh, can be created without you know blind luck? Is there more to it? Because you raised a very interesting question. <laughs> so, so let's look at the three questions which you asked. Uh, do what you enjoy. Now, I had no idea what foreign exchange or treasury sales was about. I remember going into that interview in New York, I think in December 1988. And uh, within five minutes, Jaidev tells me, Louis, what do you think about marketing foreign exchange products in India? And I look at him blankly and I say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So literally, I went to do that, into that interview and uh, for a job which I knew nothing about. But uh, and it worked out fine. It worked out great because he felt that I would be a good fit. Similarly, at HSBC, the guy, uh, 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 Arvind Sethi, who gave me that opportunity, felt that this is a job that I could be a good fit at. So what's the lesson learned from that? I think it's getting to, to make sure that people know you. It's networking, which I've, you know, finally I think is a big skill. And we'll talk about that later. Because today when people ask me, what is it that you do? I say I connect dots. Because that I realize is my key strength, the ability to connect with people. And and as more people know you, they throw the opportunities at you because they believe that based on what they've heard or what they've known, that you could be the right person for it. So that's about, you know, finding out how uh, how opportunities come by me and, uh, and figuring out what you like. It's a gut feel. I mean, I've done different things and we'll talk about some of them later, but I was in accounting, which I liked when I did it. I was in foreign exchange sales, which I liked when I did it. I then moved on to a larger treasury platform and then moved on to the investing side as in, in, uh, and uh, now in the nonprofit space. And I've often wondered why is it that when I'm in that particular job, I've loved doing it. But when I move on, I don't look back and stay connected with that. And I think it's just that the time has passed and I'm on to something more exciting and which, is, which excites me. But I want to come back to the, the, other, the third question which you asked is, how do you create that luck? Because yeah. I used to talk to people saying that I've been lucky. Because I've been lucky that whatever I've done is because somebody threw that opportunity at me. And I've been asked, can you create luck? 
And in life, I realize when I'm asked a question I don't have an answer for, I either go back to my wife or I go to Google. My wife wasn't there at that time, so I checked on Google and I said, how does one create luck? And I came across a page of some random guy. I can't even remember his name just now. And he talked about how do people create luck for themselves. And one is do things differently. So, and this is what I keep telling a lot of people. If you go to work, uh, if you're working in a place and you take the same bus every day, you talk to the same people, you at lunch, you meet the same people, and you go back and you do the same thing every day, you're not going to create opportunities for yourself. So what you need to do is go out over there and have those conversations with people, meet new people, chat up with new, new folks, you go for an event, make sure you're talking to somebody who is uh, out over there doing something different. At a, at a reception, talk to new people. And that's the way you create opportunities for yourself. The second thing this guy talked about was see the good in everything. Everyone is so negative. If we are more positive about stuff, even when we have setbacks, it's always... What can I learn from that experience? And that's another important lesson to learn, which is being positive about everything you do. And even if you went for a reception or you went for a meeting and you came out with you didn't get that offer, what could you have learned from it? The third thing he talked about was go with your gut. So listen to what your inner sort of mind is telling you about whether this feels good or not. Quite often, people have told me I'm crazy. Coming back to India in '89 was crazy. You didn't, you didn't go back. People didn't come back to India in '89 soon after business school. You wanted to work over there and, and you know, settle down in the U.S. Two years later, the, the 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 economy opened up in India, and I just happened to be at the right time at the right place. People tell me, "Oh, Lewis, that was very uh, you had good foresight." And I said, "No, it was just to do with the fact that I went for an interview." Because it was a free trip to New York, and it ended up with this journey. Yeah. Similarly, when I uh, left Citibank to join HSBC, people said you're crazy. HSBC is so much smaller in Treasury, but that's Which just, year was a different trajectory in terms of career. That was in '92. Uh, wonderful. 92. So from 92 till 2002, um, that you, yeah. you were in your early 30s. And I think in this 10-year period, a lot happened. Could you tell yeah. us about some of the key learnings from this uh, this 10-year period? And what were the highlights? What surprised you? Uh, well, what did it teach you? Well, one, one I got married. Okay. So I got right. married to Fiona. And, um, and she was doing her... We actually we met up, we reconnected in 89 and she was finishing off a PhD in the US and we got married in uh, 93 Jan. And we talked about the fact that our lives will be a roller coaster because I, we could be doing different things which, and you know some could work out, some couldn't work out. And I've just been lucky that things worked out for me, both on the personal side and at work. But so I spent two years with HSBC. I had a great time over there. It's a great bank. I had a chance to sort of, you know, uh, build out the team over there, learned a lot. But that's around that time, I also realized that I've had enough of being with a multinational. And uh, in a way, decisions why was were that? taken. Why, because there why were that? decisions taken by... Yeah, the reason why was because there were decisions taken by people who are sitting halfway across the world who have no idea about India. And I remember this was in the early days of the opening up of the economy. Today, there's a lot more awareness of India. But in those days, India was a small colonial outpost where, uh, where you know, you had to, which wasn't a big share of the market. So... So, so I said, like, you know, here are people taking calls on what I can do based on imperfect information. So, 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 that was, so I was looking to join an Indian company. And in those days, those Indian companies which were professional didn't pay a decent wage. And those who paid a decent wage weren't professional. And then I get a call one day saying, Louis, we're starting a bank. Uh, would you be interested? 
and this was the team which Aditya Puri was leading. Baracha was uh, was the person who called me up, and uh, and we're talking about a bank called HDFC Bank. The bank had not even got its license by then. But to me, this was fascinating. It gave me a chance to to be in a startup, and I didn't really look at startups as something that I was familiar with. I've only been in large organizations. But this was my first startup, and I literally I came on board without even discussing compensation. So I just came on board because the opportunity. Were you financially exciting. secure by that time? No, I had no money in the bank. I had no money in the bank, and that's what you know. So people tell me, Louis, it's fine for you to talk about how you shouldn't worry about money. And I said, you know, till HDFC Bank stock had some value. I had no money in the bank, so all my classmates from Chicago would be flying all over the world, going on fancy holidays. I couldn't afford it. Understood. Because I assume to me it was just about the excitement, and and, and you know maybe lucky. So yeah, so I came on board, and then I was responsible for recruiting my boss and convincing him that he should join. And uh, how did you and, do you know, that? And, Talk to talk to us about that. That is a complex <laughs> negotiation. I, 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 I can't I can't remember, but I was I was just Aditya told me, Louis, you, you seem to be very infectious with your enthusiasm to do this. So uh, so so I was involved in convincing three to four people in the bank why they should come across and why I was giving up my job and why they should do the same with this. And people were concerned about oh I don't have my fancy car, I don't have my fancy club memberships, etc. And today it looks like a no-brainer, but at that time it was difficult convincing people. We struggled, and uh, and uh, you know, and who who knew whether we would succeed or not? Because people said we were crazy. Why would you want to go and join, try to set up a bank in India? No one had tried to set up a bank in India. What was the operating like thesis about? of the bank, and uh, what specifically, in addition to having skin in the game, made sense to you? I think it's just the quality of the team. The team that Deepak Parik put together through Aditya Puri was fabulous, and that's and that's why you know when you look at the fact that this bank has grown the way. Well, I mean, let's let's be clear. No one expected HDFC Bank to be where it is today. It was beyond our wildest dreams. And uh, I mean, in fact, if I had known it was going to do so well, I wouldn't have sold any of my shares earlier on. But <laughs> but the, the fact is that he brought in uh, it, it's the quality of the team and uh, a huge control on cost and uh, on credit. I think that's that's what's important. You had credit run by Paresh Shubhankar, so we were never the fanciest, most aggressive bank. For example, on the treasury side, there were other banks who were more aggressive. But you know, they they. Uh, those banks, some of them don't exist anymore today. Or those banks, uh, you know, share price hasn't done the way HDFC Bank has done. I think it's just focusing. And you know, in those days, we never even talked about share price. It was all about let's just build a bank. Let's pr- prove that we can build a bank that we'll all be proud of. And uh, and, and so you did. The HDFC, uh, you you all built it into an institution. Um, yeah. How like what was uh, what were some of the highlights and challenges of building it, and what did you do after? Well, the first was really trying to put everything into place. That you know you you had to uh, build up quality uh, quality operation. I was running the FX sales initially, FX the FX desk, both sales and trading, and then later on ran the treasury. And it was really making sure that. One, we had the tech platform to be able to build, uh, to operate on. Two, we had the limits with different customers and banks to be able to transact. And uh, three was we had great people to run the team. And we weren't paying the highest amount in the industry. Not everyone had huge ESOPs, so it was difficult getting good people. But we brought in people still in touch with each other uh, 25 years later, still friends. And uh, we were all part of that, you know, banking revolution way back in '94. Uh, we had challenges. I remember when uh, the ATM card of one of the bank directors got swallowed by the ATM machine, and there was chaos. Sometimes our systems would crash. Uh, 
uh, and uh, eventually we built out something. We were focused on on cost tremendously. No one flew business uh, class. Uh, I remember one day at the theater said, everyone brings their own coffee mugs to the office. We will not be giving coffee mugs, and there was a lot of uh, opposition to it. And you know, today it's just part of the DNA that you know we're not going to be spending too much. We're going to focus on the customer, and uh, and that's resulted in in what it is today. In 1999, I'd been in Treasury for about 11 years, and I was but I was bored, frankly. I was looking to do something different, and uh, because I had this great team in place, and our kids were small, and I'd leave at I'd, get, I'd come to the office on time, and from earlier in my career when I'd be the last guy. Out. I'd leave at 5:30 so I could spend time. And then I said to myself, "I'm too young to be leading this retired life." I was uh, in my late 30s, and right. uh, and I wanted something different. So I went to Aditya and I said, "I want I want to do something else in the bank." But there there wasn't anything that I could uh, do. And he said, "Treasury is important." And uh, and this was the days of the internet. So I was intrigued by the internet, but I couldn't figure out. What did a treasury guy do in a, in a dot com? And uh, I was pitching for business with uh, Infosys, and I was connected with a guy called Mohan Das Pai, who at that time was the CFO. I wrote to him. He said he doesn't have time to meet me, but I could meet his assistant Bala. So we were sitting with Bala and talking about HDFC Bank, and Mohan walks in and starts talking about some small company which needed help and. I connected him with a couple of people, and he says, "Louis, you're wasting your time in banking. You should be in the IT sector." So I told him, "You're crazy." He said, "No, no, you're crazy." And we got talking, and he said, "There's somebody who wants to meet you." And within half an hour, this tech entrepreneur called me up and said, uh, "Mohan says I should talk to you." So I met up with them a couple of days later, and suddenly I started getting a lot of phone calls from people in the tech sector. And I realized, oh, "Are you comfortable sharing?" What this person is? Uh, no, I no no I won't I won't I won't I won't I won't. I won't. But, okay, uh, let's leave it at the but, yeah. but but I started getting a lot of calls and the, and I realized that one there was a shortage of skill sets in the tech sector in 1999 and secondly the model was very simple IT company plus CFO equals IPO. You have a company, you want to go public, you need a CFO. You call Mohan, Mohan says call Lewis. The model was very simple. And I was talking to my wife, saying, "Here am I trying to figure out how I can add value to a dot com." And all these guys are calling me up because clearly I realized, and this is another thing that we often do: we uh, we underestimate, or in some cases, a lot of guys overestimate their value add. I clearly underestimated my value add. I was looking at myself as a treasury guy, but these guys looked at me as a chartered accountant, a guy with an MBA, someone who's been in a startup. Someone who's been in a bank and someone who can bullshit, you know. So I was a good CFO. So I decided <laughs> to join. So I actually decided to join a small company in Bangalore. Again, as I said, randomly through something, someone that Mohan had interconnected me to, and Mohan and I had just met once. Uh, right. And uh, so I go to Aditya on a Friday evening because this company was actually good, and I can't mention the company name, but this company was pitching for work at HDFC Bank, and I was involved in. That decision process. So I told go to Aditya on a Friday evening, and he tells me, "Louis, you've uh, you know what's happened." I said, "Listen, I've been talking to you some time about doing something different, and I'm going to be leaving now, and I'm going to be joining a small company." First of all, it shocked him that someone would leave, walk away from options that are that were you know way in the money. Right. Uh, and uh, again, you know, so I remember my wife and I talking about it and saying, you know, we're going to walk away for the first time. We're walking away from money. Earlier we were just walking away from opportunity, but here we're walking away, leaving money on the table. And I could have stayed on for the next few years and made enough money and been comfortable. But to me, I'd, I'd be miserable those few years, and I still had the energy in me. So I go to him and tell him I'm joining this small company. He says, "You can't join this small company. You're crazy. I refuse to talk to you. Let's talk on Monday." And that was it. That was the end of that conversation. So I go back. So to he my refused room to I... have a can finish the conversation. Now go ahead. What's the question? No, no. I, I was just wondering that like, he refused to have a conversation about yep. uh, about the idea. Seems so preposterous to him. Yes. Yeah. Did it take yeah. make you doubt your decision? 
No, no, it didn't at all. In fact, I went back to my room and I called up a young venture fund, which is a client of ours. They just started business and uh, and they were investing in the type of company that I was going to be joining. So I call up one of the partners and I say, you know, I'm joining this company. What do you think about it? And this guy says, Louis, uh, I, we, we're expanding our team. We just met up with Mondas Pai and he said, we should talk to you. And I said, but I'm joining this other company. And he said, no, no, can we meet for breakfast tomorrow? So I go meet up with this small firm uh, the next morning for breakfast. And uh, I decide that I'll become a venture capitalist instead. This firm is called Chris Capital. And that's how I moved to the investing side. So I go back on Monday to Aditya uh, and I tell him I'm leaving. And he says, to join that small company? I says, no, I'm joining uh, Chris Capital. And he says, what happened over the weekend? I said, it's a strange world we live in. And it's as random as <laughs> Clearly. that. Yeah. It's as random as that. you know. And that's how I got into the investment. I just felt I had a good feeling about it. And I spent two years, Ashish Dhawan and I spent a lot of time raising our, our second fund. We had no money. We used to travel at late night flights because they were cheaper. We would share hotel rooms. And, you know, and here was I, by that time, HDFC Bank had become more established. And I gave up all those comforts to be in this startup again. And that's when I realized that I like to be in smaller organizations, startups, as opposed to being in larger places. And... Uh, and I did that for two years, and uh, I realized how was that the, how were those two years working fabulous. with uh, Ashish in Chris Capital? Fabulous years. Uh, I think Ashish is one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with, and uh, high energy. Learned a lot, but we were also impacted by that whole meltdown in the dot com industry, and we started doing a lot of investments, which didn't personally excite me. So it was great financially, but to me, it wasn't something that excited me. So again, it was a call. I had Now I had some money in the bank and uh, I had some financial stability when I said, you know, you know it, it's, but, but it doesn't excite me. So I reached out to one of my mentors, Deepak Parikh. I called him up and I said, Deepak, I want to meet you. He said, come over tomorrow. And I told him I've had enough of the of this tech investing and being in the, in the early VC stage. And I wanted to do some development stuff. And if you can give me a, a half-day job at HDFC so that I can be home when the kids come home. Because also at that time at Chris Capital, we were working crazy hours. And for the first time in my life, I was missing parents' day of the kids, the kids' concert. And I said, that doesn't make sense. We were, our son was a few years old and he'd go to sleep before I came home and I'd leave before he woke up and I said this is bullshit I mean I'm only seeing him on weekends it doesn't make sense so so I uh, and, and to me I've also always believed that when when you sit down and realize the only reason to stay on was for the money that's the time to leave and uh, so I so I told Aditya, I told Deepak, I want to work for half a day and be home when the kids come. He looked at me and said, I don't have that lifestyle. I don't see why you should. But why don't uh, you talk to IDFC? We've just got a mandate from the government to set up an infrastructure equity fund. Why don't you set it up and run? Talk to Nasser. So I go across to Nasser and I talk to Nasser Munji, who was the CEO of uh, IDFC. And uh, the government had a month or so before that, given IDFC the mandate to set up an infrastructure equity fund. So so here was I, just because I worked in Chris Capital, people thought that I was a great investor. And, uh, and to me, this was exciting. I took three months off. I told them, let's, I want to take a break and hang out with the kids. And that's what I did. And, uh, and then in August, I think of 2002, I went back to IDFC and said, okay, it's time I, got, I started, get, started get, getting back to work. And uh, But that doesn't you know, sound like a half-day job. No, no, it was a full day. So no, I, but that was, I said, Deepak <laughs> said, I can't do a half-day job because uh, uh, he doesn't have the same lifestyle. So, but you know, but to, me it was, again, to me, it was the challenge of, again, doing something which everybody said was stupid. Everybody I met said, you cannot make money investing in infrastructure. In and, India uh, at that time, yeah. Yeah. And when someone tells me it can't be done is when I get excited about it. So why and is that? Said, you why won't is be able that, to uh, money. 
Because I'm a, I'm, a strange, I'm a strange guy. <laughs> I'm crazy. But honestly, no, but I, I, I love the, the contrarian in you. I mean, everything that we've, re- we've read about you, the work that you've done, I think you are one of the... Being a contrarian energizes you to some extent. At yeah. least that's our thesis. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and, I, and I keep telling people, do things that are different. If you take the same path everybody is doing... You're not going to stand out. Do stuff which is different. What's the worst that could happen at IDFC? The bank, the, the fund doesn't take off. I look stupid. My ego will get bashed up. I won't have money. I'll have to go back and start something afresh. Maybe I won't get the same job I had last time. But I'm sure that there are some skills that I will pick up even in a failed attempt that can be valuable later. But a lot of people don't want to take that risk yeah. Um, wow. So this is 2002. And how does IDFC shape up? Does it uh, meet your expectation in terms of challenge? How did you think through your next steps? And what was so, the experience so look like? At it. Here was Deepak telling me to set up, Deepak Parikh telling me to set up a fund. Uh, and here was I setting up India's largest fund where, one, I had no experience making investments. And two... I knew nothing about infrastructure. So, I mean, it was a recipe for disaster. So the first thing I did was actually Nasser was very kind. He gave me a free hand. And uh, and uh, I basically got people on board who, who understood investing and uh, who understood infrastructure. And uh, we had a team of four, Darius, Sham, Nimesh, and I. And uh, we got about starting the business. We got in a great CFO, Rupa, and, uh, and, and that was it. We set up systems. We, a lot of it was, you know, home spun. And uh, we raised a fund from domestic investors. It was the largest domestic fund at that time. And uh, we wanted to make sure that our first investment did not blow up because everyone was so skeptical about investing in infrastructure in India. And the uh, first investment was in the GMR group. It turned out to be our best investment ever. And the GMR family and I and my family are you know, very close. And we've really been together. And today I'm one of their advisors on the group performance appraisal committee. And, uh, and, you know, and, and that's what we did. So we started off with our first fund. By the time I left in 2010, we'd raised three funds. We were managing $1.3 billion dollars. In 2009, uh, we were voted the best private equity fund in India. We were both voted the best infrastructure manage, uh, investor in Asia. And uh, I guess the time was right at that time for me to move on. We built up a great team. We proved the fact that you can make, in, you can, you can make money investing in infrastructure. And I felt that, okay, it's time for me to move on. Uh, IDFC had become uh, large, the parent company. We had, we'd lost, in my view, we'd lost some of that entrepreneurial spirit. So I felt it was time for me to move on. And uh, in 2010, I stepped down at, uh, at IDFC. And I had, no, I had no plans of what I would do. I literally had no idea what I would do. All I knew is what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't start something on my own and I wouldn't uh, do anything full time because our kids, at that time were thir- our kids at that time were 13 and 15. And I said before they go off to college, let me stay at home and traumatize them. <laughs> I'm a terrible father. So that's what I did. I, I hung out at home. So a, a lot of my time in the first couple of years after I quit was really spending time at home. To me, my most... So my my sort of scarcest asset was time. So I, and with kids, as you know, as you learn over time, is that is that you know you you got to be there when they want you, not when you when you want to be free. So it's a question of being available when they are. And um, it, yeah, and uh, if I look at your career from eighty nine to two thousand ten, thirty years of uh, working relentlessly. You've had this knack of picking things up uh, quickly. 
how what's your learning recipe how are you able to do that what's what advice do you have for others uh, in the in like what try you know listen willows why don't you look at this we'd like you to do this why do you think and quite often some of them are crazy but to me that's what that's what's appealing got it and so you were able to like move, moving forward let's say it's 2012 13 uh these two metrics are there no nothing full time and you want to spend time with your children um yep what what was the next phase like it seems like your career is like always a uh, uh, you're looking for a new set of adventures so what yeah. uh, what did you decide to do next i didn't decide anything if people decided for me so so the first thing i got involved with an organization called sneha which works on women and child health issues And I remember the founder meeting up with this is a lady I knew actually a couple of the organizations I initially got involved with were things that my wife was involved with as a volunteer one was akanksha in my uh, early bank of uh, private equity days and secondly was uh, sneha which my fiona was uh, a volunteer and I remember meeting armida fernandez who started this and uh, telling her you know mira i know nothing about the health space and i'd rather look at education and her point was you know louis if kids don't get proper nutrition by the time they're three whatever you do on education is a waste of money and that's so true and that's how i got involved with sneha and i initially i came on because there was it's a great organization run by some passionate people but i saw a role to build in some processes and also to get a full time ceo in board so i looked at that and that's so we did for a few years brought in uh, a lady called Vanessa who does a fabulous job as CEO of uh, Sneha and she's been there for I don't know about 6 odd years 7 years and uh, I was on the board for many years and then I realized after about 5 years that you know, my time to expire has come and I stepped down as still I'm an advisor to them and I stepped down but that's an example of the different things that I've done along the so over the last 10 years since i quit full time work uh i spend uh, there are about four organizations today that take up my time two are things that we started over the last few years and uh, two have been organizations which are more than 20 years old the older right. organizations is a think tank called the center for civil society Again I was having lunch one day with a guy called Ajay Shah and he said Lewis have you met Parth Shah and I met up with Parth and he said then I found that the work that they're doing at the Center for Civil Society is great he came back to India to teach the youngsters public policy and talk about the the ideas of freedom and personal choice etc and stuff that you know I learned a lot about it when I was at University of Chicago so got involved over there and now I chair the board and uh, we've done some fascinating stuff and through that we started last year the Indian School of Public Policy India's first one year post graduate certificate program in public policy and that's going fabulously well and we have a startup uh, hiccups but we've got a good team running it we've got a fabulous academic advisory council chaired by vijay kelkar we've got a great political advisory council set up uh, run by suresh prabhu we've got some fascinating students with diverse backgrounds and uh, the faculty is uh, mind blowing uh, so so that's taken up my time we've also all our students at ispp get a certificate in public policy also from the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago the first time public policy students in India at an Indian school get a foreign qualification also and we have not even finished one year so so that's the second thing that takes up my time ISPP the third is an organization called Coro which is 30 years old initially started off as an organization in Chembur to teach adult literacy to people whose kids are going to school and uh, today we run a fellowship program where we train people over an 18 month period to be better grassroots leaders uh 70% of our fellows have come from backward communities 70% are women 40% have only been up to primary school and and the things i learned from them is just phenomenal and the battles they've had to fight and the prejudices etc and they've all th- four years back one of our women 
one of our former fellows was on BBC's top 100 aspirational women in the world. That journey is phenomenal. So, so that takes up, that's the third one. And then the fourth is a mentoring program for Catholic youth called Take Charge. And, uh, and that's, again, something which uh, is so important because today a lot of youngsters uh, need someone to, need, the, need a shoulder for them to hold on to, to move forward. That's what we do. Lewis, you're also very interested in um, well-being, productivity. Um, you wrote an yeah. essay recently. Um, what inspired that? And what were, like, what if you could share the key takeaways from that? <laughs> yeah, uh, so people ask me some of these things, and I, and I struggle because a lot of these things just come intuitively to me. Um, you know, it's, I just do what I do because... I don't think much about it. It just flows. Even some simple things with... Uh, so, so, so time back when Pride Global was starting off, they reached out to me and said, this was Ariana Huffington's new thing, and she said, will you write for us on, on well-being? So I said, sure. And they've given me a free hand to talk about anything that I want to write about. And uh, I think the article they're talking about was be kind to yourself. Yeah, and uh, so I was speaking at a at our at a at our kids' uh, school uh, prize distribution day, a graduation convocation day, or something like that. And uh, and they are, and I had to speak to the students and I asked Fiona, I had a few thoughts and, and asked Fiona, what do you think about it? And she said, tell them also to be kind to themselves because. Everyone sometimes too, we all too tough on each other. We want to come first, and I was a person who never came first in school. I barely passed through. But yeah, we, there's so much pressure people are on, uh, uh, put on themselves, and therefore it's important that they also get time to uh, to be kind to themselves and take time off. And uh, and that, and that's and that's what I wrote about. And 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 it's really some of the lessons, things that I do. Uh, and I think today people take, also people take themselves too seriously. People should sometimes realize that they got to chill a bit. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, th and that's something which, which I also sort of think that, that uh, people need to do. So I'm trying to sort of, you know, look back at some, I'm trying to remember what all I wrote about on this. But uh, I'm trying to sort of like, I, I'm trying to empathy for what, yourself was a key takeaway for me. How how can you have empathy for yourself? How can you be kind to yourself and in the process be kind to others? And I thought that was such a such an important lesson for work and life. Um, so I thought uh, our listeners would uh, would like to know from the person who wrote it his career, his ideas, and you know his ability to reinvent uh, himself. Um, you know, I know we're coming to the close of the podcast. I just want to uh, conclude by asking, are there some books or pieces of literature, music that have made a huge impact on you and any parting advice for young people trying to figure out what to do with their lives? Uh, okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll suggest a couple of things. One is, uh, I love reading, by the way. I think people need to read more. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to read books. You can read books on your iPad, on your Kindle. You can read articles, but people need to read. And there's so much interesting stuff. There's so much to learn also. So I've done a lot of courses, for example, on Coursera. And I, and I for example, did this, I was introduced to this guy called Yuval Harari, who wrote Sapiens. And it's only because I did a course with him on Coursera. And then I got to meet him a couple of times subsequently when he came to India. And it's been an eye-opener about how did mankind go from being at the bottom of the food chain to the top. So... So courses like that I found to be very useful. And today you have the opportunity to do so many of them. Uh, so that's one. Secondly is I think people need to take the time out to meditate. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's important to, to take that time and solitude. And as I wrote in that blog, you know, I don't do it the conventional way. I work on, a, I use a Headspace app and... Uh, and that's what I do, and I find it useful, and I can meditate wherever I am. Like I'm going to head off for a meeting, and I'm meditating in the in the in the cab when I'm over there. Avoid unnecessary stress, uh, and you know, and and I remember seeing this movie with Julia Roberts in it called Eat, Pray, and Love. 
and uh, and I heard about this phrase called dolce far niente, the beauty, the sweetness of doing nothing. Sometimes just take off and do nothing, uh, and do what you love. So so it's a combination of things. But basically, what I'm saying is, I I'm, I'm running today faster than I've run ever. But I you got to sometimes take time off. uh and 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 smell the roses uh read a lot hang out with friends and do what you love and if and the last thing is don't chase money money will chase you yeah it's a fascinating note to end on uh, thank you so much louis for your time we seriously appreciate it um and we look forward to catching up with you and uh, hosting you for a master class following up Thanks Utkarsh thanks for this opportunity see you soon bye